Right, welcome. And um, for our final catch-up call, we have promotion heroes, Liam Rossini and David Stockdale. Um, both of these guys left an indelible mark during their spells at the Amex. So, to get us rolling, I'm going to quickly ask you about how your lockdown's been, and then we'll look back at your Albion career. So, Liam, I know you've got plenty of children at home, so what's your lockdown been like? Do you know what? At the start, for the first month or, or six weeks, um, it was been really nice. Uh, it's probably the first time in my life I was able to spend some real good quality time with my wife, Erica, and my children and not be focused on football. So I was really present, you know, sitting down, doing schoolwork with them, breakfast, lunch, and dinner all together, having conversations, and I really enjoyed it. But the longer it's gone on, the more you're itching to get back and having a focus. And, and now we're at Derby, we're back into training, which is great. Um, but the most important thing for everyone is that everyone's safe and, you know, and everyone's well. And what's been really difficult is the lack of connection with people, not seeing people um, on, a, on a one-to-one, on a human level. And hopefully we can get back in a, in a safe place the sooner rather the better. And Stocko, I know you've got a hat-trick of children. How has it been being at home? Um, yeah, echo the words of Liam, really. You don't get an extended time at home with your family and just you guys. Um, I think the most challenging for me is homeschooling. Uh, I think I've learned more in, in the last 10 weeks than I did in my 10 years at school. Um, but yeah, um, you get itching to get back and you never lose that itch as a footballer. And when you do, usually they've retired and end up a coach like uh, some people. <laughs> So I'm going to take you back to when you both originally came to the South Coast and joined Albion. Um, David, is it fair to say maybe your first few weeks weren't, you probably weren't at your best or you didn't show it? I think there was a few question marks over you from fans at the start and then all of a sudden it all seemed to click and you became this immense number one for us. Yeah, um... Probably the first 40 weeks, I'd say. (laughs) Uh, um, I think coming out of a difficult situation at Fulham didn't help. Um, But no, it took time to settle as such. Um, And quite rightly, they were asking questions. Um, When you come in from a Premier League club and with, I say, reputation, more of a, a name as such than somebody from a free transfer, let's say. Um, Yeah, it took time. Um, But eventually we we came together as a club to to fight through that season, which was a difficult season all around. I I felt that we had an actually really good start. We just couldn't score goals and we let goals in, you know, so which sounds very contradictory. Not a good combination, mate. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds very contradictory, but... There was games where you could have 15 shots on target and we'd lose 1-0. And it kept happening. So, look, I was part of them goals and mistakes were made and I was honest enough to to agree to that. But you, like I've always done in my career, you got to prove the, the doubters. And once you start showing that and people see that, you um, you win people over. Do you think, I think it might have been, um, was it Birmingham at home in your first year, penalty save? Do you think that was yeah. kind of a moment that turned where things yeah. started then? i tell you what, the, the doc, Doc Lewis, that was the thing that he said to me. So that's the turning point straight away afterwards. And at that point, I didn't know what he meant the turning point was, was staying up or, um, but it actually was defining in my Brighton career, I think. And then, obviously, we did stay up by the skin of our teeth, but it happened. Um, and then, Liam, you come in. Um, what did you make of the club when you arrived? Because we were... I spoke to Sam and Connor the other day, and obviously, I mean, Connor came in around the same time, and it was off the back of the club's poorest season at the yeah. end. Yeah, so I, I first was contacted about the possibility of joining Brighton in March. So there was a lot of interest for a long time in me joining in the summer. Um, 
I was always aware of Brighton. I remember playing for Hull. I think Stocker might have played in the game for us. Or it might be yeah. just around that time. And I looked at the stadium. I thought, wow. And it, and it was when it, it was, we drew nil-nil. But I just felt when I, when I played there that there's something special was going to happen there. And I remember watching Gus's teams play and I really enjoyed the way they played. Um, the possession style of football. And I thought it was a matter of time that, that Brighton would get into the Premier League. So um, at the time when I was in talks to join Brighton, there was interest in a couple of really, really good Premier, te- Premier League teams. I remember my agent had a conversation with Leicester who later on went on to win the, win the Premier League and I was quite close to going there. Um, but I went down to the training ground with Erica and the, financially it wasn't a better deal for me to, to, to join Brighton. But when I saw the training ground, and I saw the amount of depth that uh, the club went into and how much they wanted me to join and the right reasons they wanted me to join. I felt like I could really help get the club to where it was going to, where I felt naturally it was going to get to anyway. And I remember when I first joined the club, I think the lads thought I was crazy because all I kept saying is we can get promotion this year and we'd finished 20th the year before. And I remember having meetings and, and Stocko, we were meetings and having meals together and talking. And I remember the lads thinking I was absolutely mad, but it was a feeling that I got that the club was ready. And, and I felt like that year was the, when we missed out, was the most enjoyable year of football I ever had in my career. Um, the, even though we didn't get the, the promotion that I think we deserved, the fact that we played such good football and we came together as a team so quickly, that was like the real highlight for me in, in my career. Um, you mentioned playing for Hull at the Amex. Is this the one where Vicente dribbled one under the wall? Adam no, Elabra the was, wall out the way. Yeah. They went under the wall and Steve Bruce went crazy at our wall after the game. But I actually played there before under Nigel Pearson and we drew nil-nil. Um, so I played there a couple of times and it's just like Brighton always impressed me. And then when I saw the training ground, I was just like, wow, this club is ready. And I, and I can try and play my part in helping the club get to where it, where it should be. So um, we'll touch on that kind of end of that first year and your Stocko second year. Um, the Middlesbrough away game, uh, you in particular, Liam, um, came out the dressing room afterwards and um, we were standing in the tunnel waiting for all the players to come out and you were very crestfallen at that moment. Can you talk us through what you were feeling at that time? Yeah, I felt, I, to be honest, I think it's been such a long time. You can speak quite openly. Um, I felt that like we were robbed. I felt we were robbed at the time. Um, I felt Dale's red card... Um, I played with Gaston Ramirez at Hull. Now, he's a great guy. Um, but what he did, I think he should have been shown a red card for putting his hands on a referee. I think the referee, Mike Dean, already made his decision to give Dale the yellow card. And I just remember running over thinking it's not even a yellow card. So for Gaston to knock the card out of his hand and for a referee not to be strong enough to make the right decision and change his mind based on an injury, it cost us massively because we didn't just lose Dale for that last 30 minutes. We lost him for the playoffs. And Dale was a huge part of our team. You know, in the midfield, used to hold our team together in terms of our shape. So for us to miss out on, on promotion in that way, when I felt like we just equalised, the, the energy had been sucked out of the stadium. You know, Stock, Stock over, you would have said the same. We all knew we were going to go on and score the second goal. And we still almost did with 10 men, you know. And, yeah. and to, be, to be robbed of that when you've worked so hard um, to try and get promotion and you know what it means to everyone, was just that was, a, it was an awful day. Awful day. What's your memory of it, David? Yeah, exactly. The turning point was me. I, re- I vaguely remember them scoring and it was quite early. But the turning point for me was when we scored and it was Dale who scored, it, they actually, even when we went down to 10 men, they dropped back even further. Yeah. They didn't try and finish us off. And even when we went to 10 men, I was thinking, we're still going to do it. We're going to get a last minute. And I think that hurt more, made me hurt more. Because I had so much belief, it hurt me more. Um, but yeah, I think Liam said everything he needs to do on that. that and, yeah, I mean, it's not... Uh, there are the odd, There's the odd person that doesn't think it, it was a poor decision, but the majority of Albion-based people think, think it was. Obviously, you said it, does, it did have an impact, took us in... A man like I think we were already about Lewis for the first leg of the um, semi-final as well. Then we had all the injuries. We come back home, play fantastic. Another dodgy decision against us for the equaliser. Season's over. 
Mm. There's a particular image of you at the end, David, and you are um, extremely upset. So can you talk us through where your head was after that Sheffield Wednesday game on the pitch? Um, again, I believe so much that we were going to win and win comfortably. Mm. Again, it like that's what people don't understand. It's like, it's not the losing. It's like, because your belief is so much, you can't believe you have lost. It's like, and we started off like a house on fire. I think we hit Bar, the post, the other post. Kieran West would have probably got man of the match. Um, and then to get the goal that went against us with a push, it felt like, but from then, even though they scored, we, we carried on. We had, three or four chances. Mm. Um, I think I think the thing was, was that group of players was so tight-knit. I remember after Middlesbrough stock, do you remember how we were devastated on a plane back and it was silent? And then we all decided to go into, um, uh, what, what's the village called outside of, of Brighton? And we had, a, we had a meal together in a pub and there were 25 of us. I forgot oh, the pub. I think it was in Hurst Pier Point. Was, yeah, uh, Haywood Heath. We were in that's Haywood Heath. Yeah. So the night after Middlesbrough, we all got together as a team and every single member of the squad was there. And we just said, we go again. And then we went into the Sheffield Wednesday game at Hillsborough and everything happened to us and the four injuries happened to us. And we came off the pitch and we said, we go again. And I remember the lead up to the second leg, like Steve Sidwell's um, knee was gone. He was playing on, on half a knee. Anthony's ankle was three times the size it should have been. But the lads yeah. wanted to do it so much for each other that that performance in the second leg was the most proudest I've ever been being part of a team because we had so much against us in the first half performance was probably the best I've ever seen Brighton play especially in the championship yeah. and it was because the odds were, were just stacked against us we had such an unbelievable group of players it didn't matter who was playing who was on the bench who wasn't in the squad and I think that carried us through to the next year as well there was I was going to mention your iconic moments for, from each of you um, and we've reached yours I think Liam um, after the first leg and you walk over to the fans and, and I'm standing behind that goal with our cameraman and I remember seeing you walk over and you were doing the, the chin up. Um, what, what made you do that? Like, cause obviously you don't plan those kind of things and it has now, it's really yeah. is quite iconic with the supporters. Yeah. You don't realize at the time and you don't realize at the time, I think the adrenaline's flowing. I got smashed in the face of blood dripping down my shirt, which I didn't even know at the time. Um, but it's just like the belief I had in the group. It was the belief I had in the group. I remember we got we went we were in a tunnel at Hillsborough and they were celebrating. And I shouted to their manager, "It's not over, it's not over yet," because they were celebrating like it was done. And I still believed, even at two 0 down, even with all the injuries, even with what happened at Middlesbrough, that we were going to do it. And um, you know, I think it was just to say to the supporters. And I think the thing about that season was obviously we had the Shoreham Air disaster which obviously Stocko was unbelievable in, in his input into what had happened. And that brought us really close together, you know, about how we could affect the, the local community, you know, and put smiles on people's faces when something so horrific had happened on our doorstep. And the whole club from, from the top down, the players, the coach and staff, the manager, the fans, they were, we were all in it together. You know, and I know it, was, it seemed like a corny phrase at the time together, but that literally summed it up that season. And I think that was the catalyst for obviously all of the celebrations and the great things that happened since. You mentioned it there, and that was probably off the field the most iconic thing you did, David, with your kind of how you reached out to the families after that disaster. It's, believe it or not, it's actually a five year anniversary this summer. Wow. So, where, when you think back to that time now, what kind of emotions does it stir up in you? Um, a lot. Uh, I still get goose pimples thinking about it, and like, like you say, it was an iconic moment. It, it it wasn't meant to be. If you know, if you get my drift, it like we did it because obviously Matt worked at the club. We had a bit of banter because he was a goalkeeper as well, and um, it was more of like, what can I do to help? And I knew that he was representing going from the club to his house. I went to the house and it wasn't what, what I could say. It was more of a support from the club, you know, past and present. And um, I think we sat and cried the whole time. I had that. It was, and it was hard because I was like, 
why am I crying? But I was thinking as in, what if this was my family? And it, it was just, it hits so hard for me and how his mum was at that time that it doesn't matter what happens football or that I'm a footballer or that somebody says something, nothing's going to bring her son back. And although it was a, a tragic accident, it it's still emotionally uh, stirring at the time. And to be sat in a room where you think, I'm lucky here to, to still have my child. Um, you still talk to them? Um, not as much, no, to be honest. Um, for years after, I don't know if he's changed his, his number, his, his brother. Um, he used to text me quite a bit, but I don't know if he's changed his number or something. Or, um, maybe want to leave that aspect of their life behind. I don't know. I didn't want to push it on. Um, but yeah, we kept in contact um, even after I left, but not as much now. Because we, we played Blackburn on the actual day of the disaster. Mm-hmm. I remember being in the press lounge and then it started to filter through that there'd been an incident. Um, and then obviously we're, we're all online and we find out what's going on. You guys are in game zone at this point. So when did the information kind of reach you that this had happened? We were, we were warming up on the pitch before the game. Yeah. I remember we got taken off the pitch. We didn't know what was going on. Uh, we heard there was a tragedy, a disaster around the Shoreham area. So the first thing I did, ran into the dressing room, took my phone, ran into the toilet and called my wife to see if they were okay. Um, and Because at that stage, we didn't know anything. Nobody knew what was, what was going on. And we still, when we played and kicked off the game and it was delayed, we still had no idea what, what had actually happened. Um, so it wasn't until after that game, you know, I think it was that we heard literally what had happened and it was absolutely devastating to, to everybody. And we used to, obviously, where the training ground is, you, you, from where every player was driving past that, that, the crash site every day, you know, and the club yeah. had opened up the, the training ground to the, the, to the police and the support staff in terms of dealing with the, with the accident. So we were literally, every day we were training after that, seeing it firsthand. And I think that really did, affect the, the players massively. I don't know about you, Stops, as a group. I yeah. remember us coming together. We had a meeting in the in the training ground dressing room and Stops, I remember you speaking in it and Bruno spoke in it as well, just saying, lads, all, all we can do is play football and make people happy in that one. And we have to stick together. And after yeah. that, I think in that period, we went 23 games unbeaten. Uh, yeah, and it was a huge motivating factor for us. Because the next, um, I think there was a League Cup game and then we had Ipswich, which we won. That's when you uh, wore the gloves for the first time, I think, wasn't yeah. it, David? Yeah. Um, and then there was this, I think there was, may have been an international break, so there was a bit of a gap, and there was a big build-up to the next game, which I'm assuming you two had already looked at, because it was against Hull. Um, yeah. And then the tributes that went around that, how much did you see of it, and what did that day mean to both of you? good question I think when you're when you're playing you have to try and um, you want to be emotional but you have to control your emotions to be able to perform and I felt the best way that I could affect that day was to help us win the game of football you know so I tried to prepare myself for the game in 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 any the normal way that I could and to be able to prepare myself to play the best that I could Um, and for me personally I had an unbelievable time at Hull Um, it didn't end how I expected it to end and I know the reasons why but I'm so thankful in a way that it did because it enabled me to come to an unbelievable club at Brighton. And there was no real, I didn't feel like I needed to prove myself in, in, as a player in that game. I just wanted to win the game for Brighton. And unfortunately, I think we played really well um, that day. We won 1 0, but it could have been 3 or 4. And it gave us belief because Hull had just been relegated from the Premier League. And I thought we were a class above them that day. And it gave us more, even more confidence moving forward. What about you, David? Yes, yeah, there's a lot going on outside. For, I don't know how much of it you were aware of and how much you saw during the warm up because there was a lot of tributes going on with giant shirts and um, yeah. family and friends there. We we didn't see much because obviously warm up they couldn't do a lot with the pitch. And like Liam says, you you're trying to concentrate on the game because if you let outside emotions get to you, it can affect the game. And we wanted to 
do well, especially on that day, not because of our ex clubs or whatever, but for the occasion that it marked. Um, so we didn't really get to see much, and all the photos and things that came out after was good to watch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, for the whole thing, I, I was well received at Hull, and I still am because I was on loan. So it wasn't like a, a longevity thing. I was on loan, did well, and we got promoted. So I was like, in and out, did well. So it's a good, good feeling. So I, I'm not one really to say, oh, it's Hull, I need to do this, I need to do that. I enjoy playing against my ex clubs because it's always a chance to show, but there's no spite as such or anything like that. Um, it was more of the occasion for, for what it represented, and it could have been anyone that was playing, to be honest. Well, as I said, it is five years since that tragedy, so I'm, I would hopefully maybe speak to you close to the time um, I'm sure yeah. we, as the club will be marking the the date um, and I just remember that we got a lot of fantastic comments about what you personally did David so I know it did make a huge difference to people Back, it made a, it made a difference to me to be honest it changed a few things in my life um, hum, humble it made, made you more humble at um, outside of football and that sometimes there's more important things even though you get sucked into the life of football um, a tragic accident or, or a mysterious accident or anything like that can change the course of people's families' lives and affect a lot more people than, than us so it, it changed a few aspects in my life Well, back onto the pitch and we'll look at some chirpier times now I've made a little list um, of the games I think were key in that promotion year. Mm. Birmingham away, Fulham away, Sheffield Wednesday at home, which we'll talk to you a little bit more about, David. QPR away. Is there any other game in there in, that I haven't mentioned that you would, look, when you look back at the season, go, no, that one was just as important? It's weird because <laughs> those games were vital. But I think every game was vital. Every, every single game we played. And I think we the squad, um, every single game that year was like a cup final for us because we, we wanted to do it so badly. And um, it was hard for me because I had my, a really terrible injury early in the season. I, it was the best I've felt for years. Um, but every game, I remember I was injured, but I would be listening to the radio, you know, and I knew other injured players were listening in on the radio. So we wanted the club to do so well. And it didn't matter who was playing and who wasn't. Um, for me, my, my highlight of that season personally was, was uh, Derby at home when we won 3-0. Um, showboat. I, I, you were showboat. Showboat, yeah. I've got all the clips. No, that, that day was mad because I came back. I, obviously, I broke my leg. I've been out for, for however long, nine, ten months. And it was a three-game week. And I had to play three games in six days. And I remember lying in my house on the day of the game. So it was a night game. I literally just lay in a room for two hours and meditated and I was limping and I couldn't play. All of a sudden the whistle went and I played and I came off and Bruno said, I'll never forget you walk off the pitch at Derby. He said, I was watching you and you just started, as soon as the referee blew, blew the whistle for full time, you just started limping again. But that was great because I remember Uwe came, came into the team that day. There were a few other changes where lads had to, uh, Fikayo had to come on and it was like that performance summed up the group. It didn't matter who the first team was, everybody wanted to do it that year. Yeah, I remember you talking about that in the documentary about that game. I, you had two injuries um, with us, and I remember the first one was Birmingham at home the year before, you, a fifty-fifty, and you just went flying. Yeah, um, but you seem to come come back from that one uh, relatively quickly compared to the one that happened at Reading, where you basically got done, didn't you? Yeah. Um, well, to be honest, it was a bad injury. Um, I broke my leg in, I broke my ankle in two places, uh, completely snapped every ligament in my ankle and had needed reconstruction. And it just didn't ever seem like I could get back to being myself in rehab. I was in constant pain and we even spoke about um, me retiring. Um, that was about six months into the injury because we just couldn't see a light. And I was going out to train and it was almost embarrassing because I couldn't run, you know. And I remember speaking to the manager and I was quite emotional about it because he asked me, you know, do you think you can still play? And I said, I, 
at the time I said the first time I said yeah definitely I can play I can play but I don't think I was being honest with myself so I went back into his office about an hour later and I said the honest answer Gaffer is I don't know and that's when we signed um, Fikayo Tomori who's obviously having an unbelievable career which doesn't surprise me because he's a great lad and he helped us especially in the QPR away game I remember he was playing centre half and he, him and Dunkey had come off ill and Fikayo yeah. was playing centre half with Uwe and he cleared ball after ball into the box both of them were absolutely brilliant and um, I'm absolutely delighted that Fikayo came into the club. And that was the thing. Every player in that squad was so important. You know, every, and the, the amount of time Stocker, we would all tell each other we loved each other. And we met. Yeah. We actually were coming to the, in the morning. We'd all, Sid, me, you, Bobby before, Bruno. And we'd all literally, we'd be training on a Wednesday. We'd come in on a Thursday. It's like we hadn't seen each other in two years. Everyone hugging each other. Connor and Dunkey were absolute, became best friends. Duff just yeah. came in, Glenn came in, and the, the actual feel of the group was something that, you know, now I'm a coach, my biggest thing I want to do is try to recreate that within a, within a group of players because the, the camaraderie and spirit and togetherness was just something absolutely incredible. Are you angry about that tackle that you were on the, that broke your ankle? Because it was a horrible tackle. And did that injury ultimately lead to your early-ish kind of retirement. I know, I know you said there was other reasons you retired, but did that injury play a role? Mm. Um, I'm never angry about the past. I'm someone who always believes that things happen for a reason. You know, I mentioned it briefly earlier when I said that when I left Hull, I felt it wasn't the right time. I felt like it wasn't I got to come to Brighton. And, and now we're talking about the amazing experiences that I've had at this world, at Brighton Football Club. And now I'm in a position now where I'm actually coaching first team football in the championship at the age of 35. And if it wasn't for that injury, that wouldn't happen. And coaching, like I've said, and, and management one day is, is what I've always more than playing wanted to do. So I tried to look at bad things that happen and negative that, that happen and, and try and turn it into a positive. So I wouldn't actually change anything. You know, I wouldn't change anything that happened in my career. It's happened and you just need to make the most of it, most of it now, really. But that injury did have an impact then. It did yeah. lead you down that. Yeah, it was hard because I knew we, we got to the Premier League and I remember I played a game against Bournemouth and I actually played quite well. And I don't blame uh, Chris at all. I, I still keep contact with, with Chris Hugh and he's unbelievable for me. Yeah, he gives me great advice now as a coach. But I think having seen the way I was after the injury, I think it completely changed his opinion of me as a player, you know, because it was such a bad injury and that he couldn't rely on me. Um, and I completely understood why we signed Galgo in the Premier League season and then it was more... Bruno and Galgo playing, but, you know, as a player, I still felt I could prove, because I did feel better that year, that I could play in the Premier League, but I completely understand why I wasn't to be. Stocko, we, as I listed those games, two of them, I think, yes, two of them had you saving from 12 yards. Um, I, the Fulham one was fantastic, and obviously there was that brilliant turnaround. Let's talk about the Sheffield Wednesday one, because an amazing double save, but maybe not maybe Glenn's save was actually a little bit better. I don't know, because... Glenn was the first save. It's actually a triple save, if you think about it. <laughs> Over two, two legs. Um, yeah, I still get goosebumps now, thinking about it when, when I see it. and um, Sometimes you think, is that me? I, I was all right, you know, once upon a time. And then my kids then see it again, and they go, and my son was like, old enough to remember but doesn't remember everything and they get to see it again they're like yeah. oh, he was alright dad <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah it's, it, it's then times and, and sometimes you've got to do things like most of that season I stood around waiting for the lads to score and Dunkey and Duffy to edit away yeah. um, I say them too because of the mainstay but like, like Liam touched on it didn't matter who came in like we had so many people that were, could have been in a championship club at that time playing first team and some of them weren't even getting in the squad. Mm. Um, it just shows you the, the strength of the loans that we brought in where they are now. Um, that, that double save, um, we have spoken about it before, but you, almost, you and Ben obviously did a lot of work on penalties because you had a fantastic record. Um, I don't know many Albion keepers that have probably saved 
the amount of penalties that you did because there was one at Brentford away I recall we mentioned Birmingham from the year before there's probably more I've forgotten um what did you know where he was going to go was this all from your research or was it gut feeling uh it's from Ben Roberts uh, basically we used to do everything uh, we used to get clips on everything and I remember specifically this one, not because I made the same, but because he had mentioned that Forestieri stutters as he runs up. And if you see, that's why I actually don't dive full length. I actually stand up a bit longer. I mean, now VR uh, had been rolled out and scrapped off the history books because it came off my line. But <laughs> I knew what he was going to do. He could have rolled it in the other corner, but because... I knew I stayed up a bit longer and luckily it went that way. Um, I think the fact that Ant and Knockout, Dale Stevens were having a bit of a hardy bargy with players and it took about five minutes for it to actually get taken didn't help them. Um, but that that's when that that and Birmingham away is when I kinda said, This is gonna be it. Not that I didn't believe before. But things happen for a reason. I remember sitting on the coach after the Birmingham game and City went, City went to me and went, we're up. But that, that's that's when we kind of knew. Yeah. That, and that's just because I was involved in that one. But there was other times like when you knew like the Derby game, the QPR game, I wasn't directly involved in, in the things that won us the game. But you could tell the fact that the change in the team the people who scored when when we're down and out and people think oh well they're not on form are they there's someone else that comes in and and puts one in the top corner S- some other central defender that's clearing them that you're like oh wow what a game he had so it's it's not just individual for us at that, that them years the second half of that penalty save though just um that's what makes that penalty save so great because of the the second fingertip save. Um, once you've dived and you know you've saved it, what's going through your mind once you've made that Im- initial save? Absolute panic. Because <laughs> I know for a fact, if I save that and then he scores a rebound, I get told off for not putting it, putting it out wide. Um, so that that is an instant reaction as a goalkeeper. Like You, you always look, so if you make a save and it's, and you palm it back out, you're always worried who it goes to. And sometimes you do get that excited that you save the penalty, you're a bit like, you lose your head for a second. So I think it was like taught sheer panic that made me save the second one because you're thinking, where's the ball, where's the ball, who's got it? Um, and it was to be at that point, and then I got beat up by all the players. So <laughs> Yeah, as always. Um, obviously that is a, Take the second half of that penalty save out. Um, cause, and just as a the initial penalty save, as I said, you saved quite a few for us. What one would be the one that you thought was the best just general penalty save? Uh, the, the Fulham one uh, and the Birmingham one from the year, year before, that was, that was the one. Probably the Fulham one because he was a little bit behind me um, and he hit, hit it well. Um, and again, um, moments can change the course of a game. Um, yeah, that was unbelievable. I, I was at that game and Fulham battered us. They battered yeah. us that day. And obviously it was, they, they, I remember they went 1-0 up and then obviously Stocker made the penalty safe. But then when Dunkey scores the goal, the header, and the whole of the, was it the Hammersmith end? The Putney end, sorry. Okay, yeah. um, just, just erupted with the whole, the whole stand went up. And I remember that. And that was one of the moments where I thought, yeah, this is, this is our year. You know, Thomas scored and, and, and Dunkey's yeah. run up the pitch for no reason, headed it in the net. And it was just, <laughs> yeah, unbelievable day. And I was actually there. I was still injured at the time, but I was in a tunnel. So I used to want to travel with the lads and just be a part of it. And I just remember jumping around. It was, uh, that was an unbelievable day. Unbelievable. I remember um, Brentford away, you saved one as well. And I, it, we did a bean back at yeah. the stadium. And I remember it was, I think it was 2-0 uh, at this point and you saved it. 
And I sat next to my colleague, Tim, and I said, well, that is the most pointless penalty save <laughs> in the of penalty save. Because we weren't in the game. Um, it just looked, we just got tonked by Huddersfield. And then all of a sudden, that penalty save becomes huge. The, the game went mental. Like not, I, I'm not saying it was because of that, but it kind of like everyone just went, okay. And then we got it back to, was it two or we got it back to? Yeah. And then, then literally they scored in the 89-59 like, second of the game. It was like all that hard work and then, again, the history books, we, we like to write them up and like 93rd, 94th minute, was it? Oh, yeah, it was deep in. It was, it was last, it was literally last kick of the game, I think. What I do remember at that game is, it was fan, oh, it's one of my favourite games of the season, even though we didn't win, just because the of chairman. the chairman. The chairman in the, in the away yeah. end. But I remember um, we had a cameraman behind the goal um, and he sent us all the footage through and I was thinking, right, we'll get some really fantastic celebration shots of the lads like, um, that we can put out on social media and they'll all be buzzing. Everyone looked miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we've just equalised in the last minute from a lose and we were 2-0 down. Everyone looked miserable. I mean, what was, what was the feeling after that game then? Because it doesn't seem like it was the same as maybe the rest of us. We, we should have won, I think. Yeah, I think that was the I think that was the driving force of of what we had in that team was no one accepted less than a hundred percent. So while I, I know the mentality of the group, we got back to three freaks. So I was there that day in the dressing room afterwards, and instead of talking about the comeback, everyone was talking about the goals we conceded and what we yeah. had. And Stockholm was great at we always we'd be shouting at each other, near grabbing each other in the dressing room, and then as soon as the game was done. We'd go out for a meal together with our wives and kids, or we we were so close, but we could we really drove each other. You know, we weren't afraid to point the finger at each other and, and drive each other on. I think that Brentford game summed, summed up the spirit in terms of that. We end up obviously finally achieving the promotion. Um, how much sweeter was it because of what had gone on the year before? And what if I say to you? Brighton have Albion promotion season. What is the one kind of overriding image that comes into your head? What's the thing that you instantly think about? Uh, Liam, I'll go to you first. Um, right, I'm one on, I keep going on about, but the team spirit. And I remember obviously Anthony's father had passed away. And obviously Sid scored that unbelievable goal with his left foot from 100 yards out. But I think what... <laughs> What was unbelievable was that every player in the squad jumped on the bus, you know, drove drove for hours to France to be there with Anthony at, at his funeral. And I think there's certain things where, you know, we're all, we all love football and we want trophies and we want promotions, but that, that team ethic and that, that determination to do well for each other and the love that we had for each other, that was the reason why we got promoted. So rather than thinking of the, you know, like the... The, the bus tour driving f- uh, through Brighton with thousands upon thousands of people mm-hmm. was something I'll never forget. But if someone was to ask me actually what was it about, it was all the things every day, how much we enjoy training with each other um, that, that I'll remember from that season. And you, David? Yeah, I, I hate to be boring, but he's right. <laughs> I, I, I can't even think of something else where I could even be funny and say Norwich City away springs to mind. Don't worry, Don't worry. we're going to come to that. <laughs> oh, no. It was like, like you said earlier, like the fact that you'd hug like you'd never seen each other in two years. You know, I, you, you had people who, like, you all had your own seats and that, but you were never sat in it. It was always like we'd have games up in the in the players thing, and uh, the the funny thing is like. I've been at other clubs where you'd literally, as soon as you finish training, you get changed, go home. We'd find excuses and games on the dartboard or on the table tennis, and we'd be there till three o'clock. And there's people ringing up going, where are you? Are you, are you finished training? No, nah, no, nah, we, we've got an afternoon uh, games session. And there'd be 10 or 12 lads sticking around till three o'clock just playing darts. And I, I would love to do one of these interviews, but with the partners 
and they, I, <laughs> I imagine what the different kind of aspect I'd be getting. Yeah. Like, I hated that promotion year. They never came home. They were always out. <laughs> they went to Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, up the pub after being away all weekend. Yeah, it's a very different story, I think. It's all right. We took them to the ice bar in uh, Florida, didn't we, Liam? Yeah, that was that was amazing. So that that year, we actually met up in Florida. Um, we were in Florida at the same time. We had a lovely meal. It was your anniversary. And yeah, uh, we were in we were in Orlando together celebrating celebrating the anniversary. It was that, so we had a barbecue, and that, and that's what summed it up. And it me and Stocks are close, but I could call Dale up or Dunkey or Connor or Sam or Tomer or Barab. It didn't matter where anyone was from. All of all of us would just be so happy in each other's company, yeah. and that is so important in team sport. So important. Never got invited to Florida by either of you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could come anyway. Busy. Um, okay, so I mean, the promotion years we know was fantastic. Um, from my point of view, working at the club didn't win the title. I couldn't have cared less personally because we were up. I've been there by that point for six years. I lost to Palace, lost to Derby, like playoff misery all the time. It, it happened, and that's all that really mattered. Spoke to Bruno; he's very much of that opinion. Um, but I know there are people where it does still bother them. And um, so, David, missing out on the title, does that annoy you? Do you, does it, do you feel like, oh, I just, we should have done it or? Yeah. yeah. Don't worry, I get reminded by pretty much every <laughs> week by Brighton fans. Um, big one was because the last goal that seen us not win it, essentially. Um, I'll not get into that because... Like like Liam says, you try not to look back, but when you do, and, and you look back at certain things, and and for people to define a season because of one thing, is difficult. I don't. Uh, I don't think to be fair. I mean, there might be the odd fool that uses social media to make um, ill-informed comments, but I think in general, when I talk to anyone about you, or we are doing previous games, um. There is so many fantastic moments from your career. Yeah. I actually think your Sheffield Wednesday uh, double save is what defined you. I don't yeah, know. I think, I think the team, the, as a team, though, I remember, I remember like Stocks was absolutely devastated afterwards. But as a team, no one blamed because Stocks probably on his own got us 12, 15 points that year. <clears throat> you know, and like I said before, there was never any blame for individual errors or mistakes. You know, I remember the, the goal because I was kicking myself. So I actually had the ball and gave it away in the corner when we were one up. And then they'd go back down the other end and score. And so it was never anything that within the group that we really spoke about. Um, I think it helped that we had a trip to Vegas two days later to enjoy what we'd achieved. And that was, and that was a great end into the season. And then obviously the coming back and doing the bus tour through the sing. But I think we'd achieved our objective in terms of being promoted. And that, that was the most important thing. And, and Stocks played a huge part in that. It, I mean, do you class it as an error? Because from what I could see, it was a, didn't it take a deflection and you just got wrong third? I wouldn't class it as a... Um, as Liam will tell you, I'm always the first to tell you when I think I should do better. Some, sometimes you should keep your mouth shut, but I'll, I'll be honest, and mostly in the change room with the lads. It was a shot that, any time you'd normally just get across and save, but it was, <laughs> you know, what Dunkey's like putting his head or his foot in the way. I actually thought he was going to block it, so it was like it turned into a reaction save. Um, we could go over it all day, but for me, Let's it's, move on. <laughs> it's a bit a bit because um, I wanted that title as much as anyone, and it felt like I was getting the from outside, not. That thingy, but again, like like you say, that that's just a personal. On that point, it won't like. Wish, yeah, we should have won it, but then you could say, well, why didn't we beat Bristol? Why didn't we do this? So that was more yeah. of a personal point. Do we think maybe um, some of the celebrations may have affected the side's performance at Norwich? Because it was, yeah. Was... I think, I think, I think there's two ways you can look at it. I think, yeah. I think looking back, the celebrations probably did affect the game. But again, if you look at everything over that two-year period of missing out 
of the way we missed out in the playoffs, of everyone coming back. I remember players could have left in the summer and probably got better contracts at clubs in the Premier League and they stay. So the actual overwhelming feeling of being promoted, that was it. That was the objective done. And now you see the position that the club are in. So, yeah, looking back, we, if, if the objective was the title, but all we spoke about all year was promotion. So I think sometimes you just... And, and then you, you look at the, 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 the videos on the train or Dunkey and Duffy and what they are up to and Dunkey and his pants on the pitch and you just think, do you know what? You, you enjoy being successful. You have to enjoy being successful. And we succeeded in, in what we wanted to do. So, you know, having a trophy, it would have been great. But what we wanted to set out and what we set out to do was, was done. I, obviously, I saw how disappointed you were at the end of that game at Villa, Stocko. Did you know you were leaving? Is that why, why you were even more upset? Were you aware that this was, that was your last game? No. Um, we'd spoken to uh, at Brighton. We said w- we'd discuss it when, when we could. Um, and we said, look, let's win the championship and then we'll talk. So we had preliminary discussions before, but nothing where I thought I weren't going to be there. Um, but that has no impact on what happens on the pitch. So I, I wasn't even thinking about my future. I was thinking about what had just happened in the last 15 minutes after that game. So what We haven't spoken to you since you left, so I'm sure there's, there's a lot of it that is private and... Um, which is understandable, but what was the kind of reason behind your departure? Because I have to say, we kind of got wind of it in our department. I think you kind of mentioned it at one point, but we thought you were, it was like a little bit jokey. And then, and then all of a sudden you had left. And I have to say it was one of the most surprising departures, especially after the year you just had. The, the offer that Brighton offered me was fair. They told me that Matty was coming in. That's no problem. You'd get a fair chance. I had no no qualms about that. Um, hindsight, hindsight is a wonderful thing, as they say. Um, but look, I, I'm not one for sitting here and regretting decisions, um, although it might be the case. But look, I, I did what was best for my family at the time, although it might have impacted on my career. But at the end of the day, I won't take that back because your family comes first and I made that decision. And But I might not have played in the Premier League after that, but I knew that my daughter would have the best chance at her education without being disrupted. If, because um, I was unaware if you knew whether Matty was coming in. So I know you said it didn't, you were fine if they're bringing another goalkeeper. But say, for example... Matty wasn't going to come in unless you left. Would that have maybe swayed your decision to stay or did the fact he was coming in make you think, well, that's another layer on top of why it's the right um, I think I knew some more, somebody was coming in either way. <laughs> so it, it was irrelevant in the conversation. I never really thought of, and it, it wasn't a case of who it was or what it was. I made my feelings clear to the club and that's what, that sounds like I've held them to ransom or anything. They asked me what I was looking for. At that point, I didn't have anything else. Um, that's the crazy thing. People think it's where you're playing one team off against another. At that point, I actually took a chance. People don't know that, but I took a gamble and it wasn't till about... Two or three weeks later that the call came in from Birmingham. And they gave you what you were desired, basically. Yeah, three years. So it, 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 it is what it says on the tin. I got three years and I was playing at a decent level and they was looking to, to get promoted. So that as well, with the three years and bringing in the players that we were bringing in was another chance to go and try and get promotion again. Liam, I'm interested in your take because obviously you're still there. Well, the first reaction is I'm losing, I'm losing a mate. Um, the, football's, football's an industry where you have to look after yourself, you know, and, and that's something that is really difficult sometimes because you are, you, you have a great time with a club and 
you love the club that you're playing for, but when you've got children and your career is probably a maximum of 10 years, you have to do what's right for your family and not look back and think you've, you've sold them short. And we were all aware that Stocks was in um, negotiations with his contract, but players don't really talk to each other about the, the ins and outs of that, and they shouldn't because it's not, not our business. Mm. You know? um, my, my biggest thing from, from my point of view was that I hope Stock, Stock had got a club that he wanted to go to, that he got the contract that he wanted, and it would have been great if it was at Brighton, but, but it's football. You know, it happens to each and every one, one of us, and Stocker would be the first to, to say that as well. Well, the big question, Stocko, how did she do on her GCSEs, and was it worth it? It was very much worth it. <laughs> she got yeah. more than all three of us put together, I guess. She, she's, all, she's always been bright. Yeah, um, she got, uh, she got uh, nine plus, and then she got, uh, she got about, she, I can't remember what it's called, the nine... A nine is like an A star star, and then she got three eights and two sevens or something like that. So like is A stars, A stars, and B uh, A's. So look, I, that to me, when she got opened those those results, it it was more than enough, and then no regrets were were taken. Did you ever say? When if you caught her maybe not revising, no, I left Brighton for this. So <laughs> <I'll do well. laughs> No pressure. No, you see, uh, she uh, she collared me and she said, "If I get a nine, will you get me a new car when I can drive?" I said, "Maybe not a new car, but I'll buy you a car." But I thought that it was still a star a and B. I thought I was going to get a nine. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even know the didn't even know the results. No, so I was like, "How the hell do you get a nine in an a star?" So she's never going to do it. Um. And she did. Liam, you obviously stayed for the first year in the Prem. Uh, you played in that first ever Premier League win. Um, yeah. Knowing how passionate you are about the club, that must have been a special day for you. Yeah, it was funny. I'll never forget. So um, <laughs> we played and we won the first ever Premier League game, which was unbelievable. And to be on the pitch, I came on for Bruno was struggling with his back. And then I remember calling Erica couldn't come one of my children was, was ill that day so they couldn't come so I had to stop off at the Asda on the way home in my, in my track suit and pick up some stuff uh, I walked into the Asda and there must have been about 50 Brighton fans in there but I think they're all picking up alcohol from Asda and I'm going in there just to get some cowpole from my little and then I think that summed it up for me in that it, it was such a great thing but at the same time it was just like normality it's normality now. We're in the Premier League. So, um, yeah, that was a good day. That was a good day. We were brilliant that day. We beat West Brom. I remember Thomas scoring a header. Um, and, yeah, I think that we really kick-started the belief of the, of the lads that year. Is that the day you slapped Paul Hazelwood around the face celebrating? I did, yeah. I slapped <laughs> him. It wasn't the first time I slapped him. He, he, was, um, he was right in the, um, in the celebration. I remember that. We were celebrating. It was good. He was right there. And I just wanted to give him a hug and and give him a slap around the face as well. He's top man, top man, Paul. Almost if he scored the goal then. Yeah, yeah, it was. But that was, but that was every goal that we scored um, in that period. It was like everyone. It meant everything to everyone, whether it was D, the tea lady. Me and Stocker got on so well with D, the tea lady. Whether it was Tony Bloom, whether it was Paul, the photographer, everyone was just part of something really, really, really special. Stocker, when the um, Albion are playing in their first Premier League game, and I know you see you don't regret anything, but did you watch it? Was it a hard watch or were you, because you're so tight with the lads? Um, yeah, really... I, I, I wanted them to do well. I, want, <laughs> I wanted nothing but the best. I was, I, I still do it now. I still look for the results. Um, you always look for results at clubs that you, you've done well at or you've done something of, of note. Um, and like, I still speak to the lads, like obviously I still speak to, Bruno, don't, a lot of the lads that are there, and it's it's just knowing what they've been through with you to get to that point. I remember sat, we used to sit in the sauna with Bruno, and he used to keep saying, oh, do you think I'll ever make it to the Premier League? And it became a thing where the lads were like, we're, we're going to carry him to the Premier League. Do yeah. you think I'll be, I'll be fit enough to play in the Premier League? Tell you what, I'll strap you up. You can borrow my legs to play in the Premier League. That was all he yeah. used to talk about. The higher he could get that club, the better. He was a massive part. He was a huge part of our squad. 
Um, and it was weird because I came in to kind of try and replace Bruna as a right back. And actually me and Bruna now, we're like best friends. I spoke to him actually yesterday. Like we're literally best friends now. I remember uh, when the lads thought I was crazy, I stood up in a meeting and said, lads, we'll get promoted this year. And everyone thought I was mad. And then Bruno said, Liam, it was my dream to be in the Premier League. And I said, no, it wasn't your dream. It is your dream and you will get there. And then to watch him come off the pitch at Man City against the champions and get the ovation that he deserved. And by the way, he was absolutely, he was one of the best right backs in the Premier League when he played and he could still be playing now. And he was a huge part of our group and he's still a huge part of that club. And uh, he should be because he's an absolute legend. I thought it was very telling. I, mean, I spoke to him about it for the two years um, in the Prem. Everything was going all right. And then as soon as the results slipped and we were getting a bit nervous, all of a sudden he reappeared, got in the side and then results improved. Yeah. It's because he's so calm. Like he makes players around him better. You know, for how, how good Anthony Knockout was and what a season he had in our promotion year. I guarantee without Bruno behind him, he wouldn't have had that, that output. Bruno made every player on the pitch around him better, whether it was in the Championship or the Premier League. That's literally how good he was. So Bruno obviously hung up his boots uh, in the last summer. Um, you hung up yours knee two years ago, Liam. Um, <laughs> what are you thinking now? Because um, as you said, you don't tend to regret anything. So I'm assuming the decision still sits right with you. Yeah. It was really hard to, um, I had offers to keep playing and, and Brian said, look, if you, um, if you want to start coaching, then, then you can do it with us. And it was a really difficult um, decision for me because to stop playing, to do something you love is one of the hardest decisions you make. And it did affect me for a long time. Um, but then I made the decision. As soon as I said, all right, I'm making the decision. I'm not going to look back and think about starting my career again. That's the decision I'm going to go down. And what was great for me is I managed to start my coaching. I was doing Sky as well at the same time. So I was really busy mentally. I was so busy working. I was working seven days a week and I needed that period to not think too much about playing anymore. And it was an absolute, that year working with the under 23s, Simon Maruski is an absolutely outstanding coach. Shannon Roof, unbelievable goalkeeper coach. They're, they're still there now. I spoke to Shannon and Simon yesterday as well. Keep an eye out on the, on the lads that are there. And I learned so much in that period. And then obviously Dan Ashworth came in and I got to see things, how things can change at a football club. Um, getting coaching experience every day was the best decision I ever made. And I can't thank the club enough for, for giving me that opportunity. And we joked about it on text, but you are basically telling Wayne Rooney how to play football. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm telling him how to play football. Um, he's an unbelievable player. So that's what I mean. So in terms of my coaching now, I'm, I'm a senior coach at championship, one of the biggest championship clubs going. You know, we get... Our, our attendance is at 30,000 a week. Um, you know, I'm coaching every day. I'm improving. I've always made it clear that I want to be a manager. Very early in my career, I want to be a young manager. And I'm well on track to doing that. And I'm at working for a wonderful football club. and working with one of the world's best players. And yeah, I've had to shout at him a couple of times, which is a bit strange. Not to say he's not playing well, but just to get, like, get training going and be intense and training. But then what, when you watch someone up close like Wayne, his levels every day and the way that he trains, you realise why he was such a top player. And he's an absolutely outstanding footballer. The guy's an absolute genius. And it's a great experience for me to be able to be in a position to coach him. Isn't he a coach as well? Yeah, so he's to, he, his, his role is player coach, but it's so difficult to, um, to combine both roles. It's, it's almost impossible. And he, in terms of his coaching, what he does, he speaks a lot with the younger players, gives them advice. But in terms of setting up the session, it's almost impossible to try and do both roles at the same time. And to be honest, right now, having Wayne Rooney on the pitch makes us a much better team than, than not having him on the pitch. Do you think he'll be there next year? 100%. 100% he'll be there. His contract's until, I think, the end of next season. And, oh, um, yeah, so I'm absolutely delighted that he's, he's part of the club because he makes us so much better on and off the pitch. And still playing next year as well? Still playing. He could play. The guy, honestly, when you see some of the things, he scores goals from halfway line, like literally every day in training or chips the goalkeeper or he does things that you just can't believe every day. He could play for, for the next five years if he wanted to. He's an absolutely incredible footballer. Well, considering you're playing with England's, well, coaching England's record goal scorer, is he, it's a bit of a cliche question, but is he the best one you've actually ever seen in training, personally? 
yeah, in terms of technical ability, um, yeah, um, I've I played with um, some top players. I played with Edwin van der Sar, Louis Saha. Bruno comes into that category as a pure footballer. He really does. And uh, but Wayne is on a different level in the way that he sees the game and the passes that he makes. And um, but it's great for me. And these are the experiences that I need if I want to coach and manage at the highest level. Is can I engage with with a player of his level? Can can he believe in my coaching methods and what I say? So so far so good, and, and hopefully it continues. Stocker, what would be the best kind of pure footballer you've played with? Um, I've got to say, close is is Berbatov. <laughs> Absolute magical mind, feet, how he drifts around the pitch. Um, I was lucky enough to train with Wayne when I was in the England squad for a year. Um, so I know exactly what Liam means when, when he's saying that. And Wayne does a lot of things when he's on the pitch. He doesn't have to say anything. Because if he wants you to put a ball there, he'll come over, do it for you, and say, do it like that, please. Like, not in a, an arrogant way. He will do his talking on the pitch. Like, you watch him and you think, he was talking to me and joking with me three minutes ago, and now he just said, go and go for this free kick and he's putting it in top corner. Like, the switch and how he does. Yeah. And when you get to that top, top level where I was lucky to, to have trained, these people just smooth as silk and, and they, they do the talking without talking. It's, it's, yeah. it's hard to explain to people. And I was never up with the quality of all these people, but it makes you improve or want yeah, to he do improves. better. Yeah, he improves everyone around him without having yeah. to speak because he's the first in. He's practicing his free kicks. Even now he's yeah. practicing his free kicks. He's practicing his shooting. He loves the game. He's enthusiastic. We do quizzes on the coach and he, he knows the most out of everyone about who scored the 1974. He loves football. So the younger players see that and think, wow. So the, the opinion I had of Wayne Rooney before I met him to now, he's a down-to-earth guy who loves playing football. And, yeah. and that's a, the best lesson that any young player can take from playing with him, you know? Yeah. So we know that Liam is targeting somebody's job. He's waiting for someone to lose. Oh, no. That sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we know you obviously you're we know the path you want to go on. You've been very clear about it for a long time. You've reiterated it today. And David, I know on the pitch, maybe the Birmingham thing didn't go the way you wanted it to the last year or so. Um, what's your position now? And what is your, have you got any kind of targets that you want to achieve? Cause I'm assuming you are still looking to play. Yeah. Um, at the minute I'm on loan at Wickham. We're just waiting to find out the, Outcome with League One. Um, obviously, I'm I'm just waiting on that because the safety of everybody um, is the most paramount. So I'm very much of the case of whatever they decide, I'll go with as long as it's safe. So on to the next one. I'm been unlucky for the last couple of years, if you want to say that, but I've learned a lot of things on the mental side of the game and training with the under 18s I've, I've managed to help or nurture a lot of good players and including Jude Bellingham's a good friend now and his family so being able to be I'm not saying I helped him on the pitch when off field things don't go on you can help different players and working with a lot of the younger lads was was good for me humbling and you then realize that I couldn't become unprofessional in even in the predicament I was in I had to be a role model for these young lads um, so it, it was difficult but it taught me a lot of things in life you know and what's important really so I'm just waiting now. We have to 
take it on the chin with the COVID and the, the season prolonging. So look, it doesn't. It's not good in my position as a free transfer that you you're waiting. But at the end of the day, look, everybody's in a similar position as people don't know what they're doing, as in going to the shops. Uh, people don't know what they're doing if they're going back to a job. Um, so you can't really complain. Um, sometimes it's upsetting, but look, we're, we're very privileged in our position as footballers in general. Um, so I'm just I'm just waiting for Liam to uh, give me a call. I mean, waiting for a call. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really is all down to you, Liam, because you, did tell, me, you, you did tell me before uh, we started recording that you two have been promoted twice together, which exactly. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Paul and Brian, right. so could be third time lucky. Could be third well, time lucky. Well, I just need him either to get a job or to invite me to training. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing a deal over. We're doing a deal over an interview now. <laughs> yeah. If you um, you've been promoted together um, at two different clubs. Uh, either one of them better than the other. I, I I think it's weird because I think the Brighton one because it it made history as such, um, and it, it it built I believe it's built a club for yeah. a better basis. Um, whereas Hull, the sheer madness around the team that we had, the yeah. circumstances in which we went up, and it was incredible. Yeah, it's like two different things, but all yeah. very influential in themselves. Mm. I yeah, I think I think Brighton, Brighton for me, Brighton for me because yeah. it, it affected so many good people on and off the pitch in a positive way. Um, yeah. And I'll look back on my time at Brighton as the best in my career. And an amazing thing for me is I never thought that leaving Hull and, and, and at the time I had there that I would walk into something even better and then walking into Brighton from the very first day to the last day I walked out it was just an absolutely amazing amazing experience for me and um, I've made so many friends um, yourself included Adam Stocko all on and off the pitch um, and it's just like even now watching the lads playing like Dale Dunkey Bruno's now coaching the first team I speak we're now speaking we're not, our lives have kind of moved forward into a new into a new era um, but I'll look back on my time at Brighton as by far the best time of my career enjoyed every moment of it 